Hit it! Hit it! Hit it! The physics behind, for example, another question. People say, actually, the actual changes. And then the ultimate question is about the profit of the course of seven years. Welcome to the Scholar's Chair. It was Senator Elizabeth Warren that stated, give students the same deal as big banks. She further said, if the Federal Reserve can float trillions of dollars to large financial institutions at low interest rates to grow the economy, surely we can float the Department of Education the money to fund our students to keep us competitive and grow the middle class. Elizabeth Warren was speaking to the moral imperative of our nation. Tonight, on the Scholar's Chair, a conversation with Dr. Hakeem Rashid, School of Education at Howard University, and Dr. Philip Cato, St. Boniface Episcopal Church, Queen Anne Parish. At Focus, is education a moral imperative? To what extent are we obligated to, to educate the next generation? Our conversation will start right here in the Scholar's Chair. Conditions of inequality that we suffered under, when we are the oppressor, the, the dominant class, let's not impose that injustice on the others. Anybody think that you could have a just system without giving women their rights? Everyone has an opinion, and we sit around the marketplace and talk about opinion, but what is true? With the shareholder, their goal is similar to the business, to maximize profit. That belief becomes a context for a development of knowledge. Say physics is the DNA of technology because the rules for how you build new technology starts in physics. Because Quran challenges mm -hmm. the people. It's not only the people of the book. It challenges Muslims. We say secular. They hear godless. Right. What was intended? Watch the scholar's chair every Monday night. And here is your host. Dr. Cato, welcome to the Scholar's Chair. Dr. Rashid, welcome to the Scholar's Chair. Thank you. Um, Dr. Cato, tell me, what is, what is your PhD from and what was your thesis paper? Uh, that degree is from Emory University in Atlanta, and my paper was entitled The Evolutionary Theology of Joseph Lacant. Yes, yes. I'm, I'm, you, we were talking about that earlier. I'm looking forward to reading the book. Dr. Rashid? Okay, my PhD is from the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and uh, my dissertation was uh, teacher behavior and teacher expectations as they relate to pupil achievement. Wow. <laughs> is, it, is it published? Did you ever get it? Uh, no, I got a paper published out of it, but no, I didn't publish the whole thing. Sure. <laughs> Our intro says that we're going to talk about um, education as a moral imperative, right? So I want to kind of start and get uh, some terms defined, and perhaps you, we can we can just kind of talk about that a little bit. Uh, generally speaking, uh, moral imperative is is a principle uh, originating inside the person's mind that compels them to act. Right? This is this is kind of the general overall uh, idea. But I'm sure you you've been thinking about this. What is your definition for the moral imperative? Let's start there, Dr. Cato. Well, any time I hear of the moral imperative, I think about Kant's categorical imperative. Mm -hmm. Kant saw the world as a place that is full of laws and rules which must be obeyed and that any rational person will obey. And so mm -hmm. the categorical imperative, as I recall it, uh, says something to the effect that um, uh, act, on the, act in such a way that the maxim would be one which everyone would follow. Mm -hmm. And the second part of it is act toward humanity, whether in your own person or that of another, uh, as an, not just as a means to an end, but as an end. In other words, he held people in great respect, and he never wanted us to use people as a means to an end, but treat, them as an, treat humanity as an end in itself. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And these were sort of his overarching principles mm -hmm. from which he derived many rules. So more morality as a duty, essentially. It is a duty. Yes. It is a duty ethic. So. It absolutely is. Professor Hsien. Well, I think uh, I look at uh, the, the whole notion of moral imperative as kind of em emerging out of the, the nature of the human being. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as Muslims, we're taught that the nature of human, the human being is a, a, a natural fitra, which is submission to the will of God. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was interesting when I when I 
went back and I looked at Kant's whole yeah. notion of, of moral imperative, and then I kind of saw some of the people that uh, influenced Kant. Uh, one of the names that jumped out at me was uh, Ibn Tufail, who was mm -hmm. a, a uh, scholar, a Muslim scholar, uh, uh, you know, from that so-called Middle Ages uh, period. And uh, he wrote a, a, a novel, a philosophical novel, that really laid the foundation for the whole notion of the blank slate mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, what happens when the human being, you know, comes into contact with, uh, uh, um, you know, morality, if you will, or, mm -hmm. or uh, you know, it's directed toward morality. Mm -hmm. So I think that we're all on the same page here. You know, yes, we, we yes. see Kant's notion of categorical uh, mm -hmm. imperative, but we also can go back to some of of the Islamic roots, in yeah. a sense, of Kant's uh, philosophy. You, you know, it's, it's interesting when when I read Kant. That's exactly what I thought. Mm -hmm. That that it was so close, and it was it was uh, it was the idea. We we had I had a friend of mine who was, uh, who read Kant that was from Iran, and he said that he, he read the the book on. Um, uh, Kant's big work, uh, religion with uh, was it reason within the limits of uh, reason or religion within the limits of of uh, reason, mm -hmm. and he said the 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 scholar said the Muslim scholar said he wanted to flip it he wanted to have reason within the limits of religion, mm -hmm. which I thought was very interesting, um, but very very close uh, to the Islamic notion of of the the whole uh, requirement for moral action. Uh, tell me, is is education a moral a moral imperative? This is the, the the nature of our talk. This is the topic of our talk. Is education a moral imperative? Well, I think from a, from an Islamic uh, perspective, we would certainly uh, have to say yes. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the first revelation the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was Iqra, read. Yes. You know, so you've got you've got to be educated to read. Uh, throughout mm -hmm. the Quran, we see the the imperative to to learn to. To seek knowledge, uh, the prophet himself, peace be upon him, is, is a reported to have said, uh, you know, seek knowledge uh, even if it's in China. Yes. Uh, you know, he said that uh, uh, the seeking of knowledge is incumbent upon every Muslim man and woman. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. uh, the Quran says very clearly, uh, um, you know. Um, uh, oh my Lord! Uh, you know, grant me knowledge. Mm -hmm. you know? That's very true. You know, and, uh, and, and, repetitively. And so yes. it's 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 you know it is definitely mm -hmm. an imperative, a moral uh, imperative, uh, if you will, uh, coming out of the the Islamic tradition. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. and, and then the Christian tradition, uh, the, the Episcopalians particularly, have built uh, thousands of schools. Uh, oh, we have indeed. <laughs> 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 we have indeed. Yeah. You know, the way I frame this in my own thinking is that uh, the, the, the philosophical questions that interest me mm -hmm. uh, are, what is the nature of reality? How then shall we live? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in order to have any appreciation for what reality it consists, mm -hmm. one ha must have, have knowledge. Educated, yes. They have to be educated. You have to do a lot of studying. Yeah. It's interesting, I'm serving in an 18th century church. and. Mm -hmm. 18th century churches have clear windows, not stained glass windows, mm -hmm. because they believed in that period, and many have since, that there are two scriptures. There is the Holy Scriptures, which we have received, and then there is nature, mm -hmm. and one ought to be able to see God in nature. In other words, so you have the clear glass so that mm -hmm. always nature is present with you while you're worshiping. It reminds me of a reflection of, of Emerson, actually. It's uh, that's 18th century. New Englanders who wrote quite a bit about nature in this way. Indeed. Yeah. So, curiosity. Uh, we have we, we have to deal with the other word that's in the title, uh, education. Uh, Dr. King puts it this way. He said the function of education is to teach one to think intensely and to think critically. He says intelligence plus character. He said that is the goal of true education. Uh, do you agree with Dr. King? I do indeed. Yes. Yes. I would think it's a very wise observation on his part. Would you would you uh, settle for that as a definition for our discussion, or do you have your own definition? Well, I don't know that I would def try to define the discussion, but I think the most valuable characteristic you can find in any human being, but particularly anyone who is going to be in a position of leadership, is intellectual curiosity. Yeah. I think people ought to be genuinely interested in how the world works mm -hmm. and what the nature of reality is mm -hmm. and Beautiful. the nature of God. Yes, the nature of God. Because we've been commanded to love God with all our minds That's as well right. as hearts and souls. That's right. 
I, I think that's up. one of the, in a sense, the dangers of the world that we live in today is yeah. uh, this whole notion of uh, secular knowledge yeah. versus religious knowledge, mm -hmm. where secular knowledge the, or the sciences have been, you know, raised to some high level above <laughs> religious knowledge. Yes. And again, when we go back historically, we don't see that schism uh, in the Islamic tradition, mm -hmm. certainly, because mm -hmm. when we, we go back to, uh, we've talked about Ibn Tufail, or Ibn Rushdi, uh, who's known as Averroes, uh, Al-Farabi, mm -hmm. Ibn Khaldun. These people were all great scientists, yeah. but they were also great religious scholars. Yes. You know, so they, they saw no, there was no conflict in their mind between religion and science. And so science. that's the kind of, uh, when we start talking about education, we've got to talk about creating that balanced human being, that yeah. person that can recognize that there is such a thing as divine revelation, mm -hmm. but there's also the, 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 the scientific world mm -hmm. that, that uh, uh, you know, it was created mm -hmm. by the creator, if you will. Perfect. Perfect. Now, I have here as, as a matter of record that the, the, the Prophet of Islam, uh, Prophet Muhammad said, that to the acquisition of knowledge is an act of worship, and and that's that's kind of what got me into this discussion, the 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 acquisition of knowledge as being an act of worship, and I'm hoping that a lot of of uh, clergy in my in, in the community that surrounds my my where I live uh, will hear that and understand that and, and appreciate it uh, that that to in integrate the scientists to, to uh, challenge the congregation that to be an active uh, person. In pursuit of, of knowledge is an act of, of worship, and uh, and I'm hoping that that would be something that we can we can impart on. At the same time, I like to for our secular education, our secular education uh, uh, institution, our secular educational institutions, uh, to also integrate a little bit more concepts of of uh, the divine. Uh, I think it would be very helpful to uh, to students. I, I don't know. Do you agree with that or? Well, I think students need to. Um certainly be exposed to mm -hmm. concepts in religion, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. uh, various religious traditions. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think that uh, it's important that a student's going to go to university, for example, and when they come out of that university, they, knew, they know something about uh, Islam, Christianity, Judaism, mm -hmm. Buddhism, Hinduism, Taoism, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. but somebody's got to, somebody's has to expose that yes, uh, yes, them to yes, it, you know. Yes, yes. Um, but I think that it comes with being an educated person, understanding that, that uh, the vast majority of people on this planet uh, are you know, practice one or another faith yes. tradition, yes, yes. and you need to understand that. Uh, uh, you know, not just look at it and say, "Well, that's just it's just superstition. It's mm -hmm. just magic," mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. um, or, or myth. Or myth. Yeah. <laughs> what are your thoughts? I would, you know, I, would, I, I agree, but I I think I would approach it in another way as well. Sure. I agree that 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 knowledge is enormously valuable. One of the things we read about and hear about a lot right now is that there is a tremendous interest in spirituality, mm -hmm. but it's undefined, it's amorphous, it has no shape or form or it's not part mm -hmm. of a tradition, mm -hmm. uh, it's not part of an articulated religious belief. Uh -huh. And it strikes me that that is, that is an acknowledgement of the fact that there is a spiritual side to human beings, mm -hmm. but one has to learn how to talk about it. Yes. Just like we have to learn how to talk about our feelings or we have to learn how to articulate our understandings. And that only comes with education. Mm -hmm. uh, when you're a little child, you don't know how anything works. Mm -hmm. And so you have to find out how words are used and what their use is and what their meanings are about what their use is mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. how you can use them to both heal and hurt and, mm -hmm. and not make those mistakes, you know, as mm -hmm. you go through life. Mm -hmm. But it is also true that we have to learn to articulate our spiritual side. Yes, yes. yes. So tell me, what is the obligation for society to build um, uh, religious, uh, not religious institutions, but educational institutions, and what are we, ob how are we obligated to, to educate the next generation? Well, you know, I think any... Are we obligated at all? I, I, think, well, I think of, of, of course yeah. we're obligated. <laughs> okay. Of course we're obligated, and of course any society uh, you know, has to feel an obligation to develop uh, you know, educational institutions and that's what societies do that's what cultures do yeah. and it's important to understand that, that uh, the purpose of education in most cultures is to perpetuate mm -hmm. that culture from one generation 
to the next. That becomes the, the, the primary function of, of an educational um, institution. And uh, unfortunately, you know, we live in a society. We live, if we look at the United States today, where in some respects, uh, the educational institutions are doing too good a job of perpetuating the nature of the society from one generation to the next. Now, what do I mean by that? In other words, if you're a, if you're a poor kindergartner, mm -hmm. if you come from a, a economically disadvantaged background and you go into an American public school, the odds are when you come out of that public school, you're going to be a poor adult. Mm -hmm. Now that doesn't say much, you know. That, that doesn't say much in terms of the quality mm -hmm. of education in this society, mm -hmm. but it's the reality, you know. So I think we have a, a in a sense a moral imperative to try to to um, promote the highest quality education in each and every child, mm -hmm. you know. It makes, makes excellent sense. You want to take it back? It's, it, do, you, do, you think, uh, do you think that we have uh, this obligation? And do you think that we, we need to pay more attention to the disparities that we see in society? And well, of course we do. E economic and But otherwise. one can only be motivated, it seems to me, to correct those kinds of things when, when you have a larger view of what, what contributes to human flourishing. Mm. You know, we, we, that's a term I just stumbled across reading a philosophy book a few weeks back and uh, called A Secular Age, interestingly enough. Uh, <laughs> um, well, it's a very important book written by a professor, a retired professor in Toronto, yeah. uh, or wherever it is in Canada. Uh, human flourishing should be something that everyone should have some expectation of happening in the course of their life. Mm. You know, growing up, maturing, gaining some understanding of how the world works, and then being able to take advantage of whatever opportunities there are to make your life a good life. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. Plato used to ask, what constitutes a good society? Mm -hmm. And I think we need to spend a lot more time thinking about what constitutes a good society, mm -hmm. and then developing educational tools to help us develop a constitution. Mm -hmm. Knowledge by itself is morally neutral. Mm -hmm. It's the use to which you put it. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so it seems to me that, that we need to focus on not only giving people knowledge, but showing them ways to put that knowledge to good uses, mm -hmm. to change their lives and the lives of other people mm -hmm. as well. Well said, well said. I think it takes us back to that fundamental question, mm -hmm. you know, why are we here? Right. Exactly. You know, right. what is our purpose in life? You know, again, as, as Muslims, we're taught the reason we were created in the first place was to worship mm -hmm. Allah, yes, worship yes. God. Mm -hmm. You know, and part of that is, is, is understanding his creation. Mm -hmm. That's right. You know. Yes, yes, yes. And, and, and understanding the nature of God, which, which, uh, which we've been discussing. You know, there, there's another guy who uh, you, you don't hear a lot for because he's kind of a young, a young scholar, uh, Dr. Akhtar. Uh, he wrote in this uh, in the idea and the concept of, um, of knowledge from an Islamic perspective. He says Allah, God, is the first teacher to Adam and the first teacher to man and the absolute guide to humanity. Now, this this is saying quite a bit about um, about perhaps what we've been talking about. You know. Uh, uh, this rational creature that needs to be educated and taught, and at the same time given instructions of of, uh, of moral action, you know the the consequence of of moral uh, of, of acting. So, uh, just just give me your feelings about that. Do you agree with the statement? And how can students use this? Uh, uh, you know, how how can he use that for his own edification, and how and, and in his own pursuit of knowledge? That God that actually God uh, uh, was the first teacher to the first man. Uh, tell me, would would this be meaningful to a student to help the student to to better uh, to be a better student? I think it's a leap. Okay. okay. For an awful lot of students. Mm -hmm. uh, I served many years in the Navy Chaplain Corps, and one of the things I learned, as well as being a university chaplain and teacher, I learned mm -hmm. is that there are an awful lot of people who have no particular religious upbringing of any kind. Yes. I mean, they don't have a vocabulary to talk about these things. If you start, if we start using our familiar either Christian or Muslim, Muslim vocabulary, they don't know what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, I think one of the things that, that, that I would want someone to learn is if we if God is man's greatest teacher then how do we know that it is God who is speaking to us mm -hmm, in other words mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
is this an authentic teaching or leading of God or is this something else? Mm -hmm. uh, I think those are really critically important things. And that's mm -hmm. not easy to describe a, a, a curriculum for, but, but, but discerning what is worthwhile and what is not worthwhile to listen to is very much a part of an education. Mm -hmm. My young daughter one time when I was driving her to school, I, I don't know how, she was fairly young, she said, Daddy, how do I tell a good book from a bad book? Right. <laughs> And I said, that's a very tough question. <laughs> you know? right. And I said, after you have lived a long time and read a lot of books <laughs> and listened to a lot of teachers, you will begin to develop a sense of what constitutes a good book and not a good book. Mm -hmm. But I think the same thing is true about our knowledge of God, mm -hmm. uh, that somehow those of us who teach about God have to do so in such an authentic way mm -hmm. and live in such an authentic way that our words do not simply become an opinion Yes, yes. I, I think I, I, I can I quite understand the, 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 the import of your, of, your, of your comment. I was, I was just listening to uh, Houston Smith, that, uh, who, oh, whose yes. scholarship I greatly appreciated. One line he said that he believed that, we, that all the religions of the world can agree on, that, that, uh, that everything proceeds from an absolute uh, perfection. And, uh, and that's very interesting because when we say we say in the Islamic tradition la ilaha illallah Muhammadan Rasulullah, we are saying that there is there is uh, nothing greater than perfection. Mm -hmm. You know, so we submit our will to God. That's what it means. You know, not in perfection. Uh, perfection is is the is the thing that motivates your life and governs your life and who you are most accountable to. So I, I was just curious, how would a student? Actually, take the idea that, that that general concept that perfection is his educator, you know, or the concept God is your educator, God is the, the first educator to man, and uh, and and what does that mean for for his thinking about it? If if he's a religious person, he believes in God. Well, you know, if he's a religious person and he believes in God, then I think he's going to be on the path to accepting that mm -hmm. as reality. I mean, you know, if if he, again, if he comes out of the Islamic, Judeo, Christian tradition, and he's going to believe, yes, it was Adam that was the first one sure, that sure. was taught, you know. Mm -hmm. um, now the question becomes, what does he do mm -hmm. with that? Exactly. You know, and it gets, gets back, exactly. to, back to this whole issue of why are we here in the first place? Right. You can believe that, yes. but then how does that relate, how does that relate to me? And I think that's the question you're asking, sure, how does that relate sure. to me at a personal level? And this is where the parents come in. Yes, that's right. You know, yeah, this it. is where, where parents come in. Uh, mm -hmm. um, and you may not be teaching your child constantly mm -hmm. that, you know, that, uh, that Allah, that God taught Adam, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. you are teaching them to be the best that they can be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and for us as Muslims, as part of their ibadah, as part of their yeah. worship. Yeah. You know, in other words, uh, you know, you, you're, you're, you're commanded by Allah to be the best Muslim mm -hmm. that you can be. Mm -hmm. Part of being the best Muslim that you can be is seeking knowledge. knowledge. Yeah. You know, yeah. so, it, you know, one fits the other. And then ultimately, the, ultimately, children in any faith tradition, they mm -hmm. have to grow up and decide for themselves yes. whether they want to accept that faith mm -hmm. tradition. That's right. That's exactly right. You know, you have twice alluded to, 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 to which I really appreciate, mm -hmm. to what, to, there's some four big basic questions that everybody has to deal with in the course of their lifetime. Mm -hmm. Where did I come from? Mm -hmm. Who am I? Mm -hmm. Where did I come from? What am I doing here? Where am I going? Oh, no. And it seems to me that if we can get young folk to start thinking about those big questions. Mm -hmm. You know, who am I? Everybody wants to know who they are. Sure. Mm -hmm. uh, where did I come from is not Peoria, you right, know. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> that's where you open up the conversation about a creator and uh, that sort of thing. Sure. And then what am I doing here is the basic moral ethical question about how am I living my life? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then where am I going means for what do I need to prepare? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, excellent, excellent uh, way of thinking about it. Uh, the acquisition of knowledge and certainty, is, the, uh, is there room in the faith tradition to entertain doubt, uh, conjecture, and skepticism? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, <Yeah. laughs> go, go follow up on your statement. <laughs> I, you know, it's really interesting to me. I, some religious people you meet think you shouldn't doubt anything or right. you shouldn't ask questions about anything. I don't know how else one learns. Yes. Uh, it seems perfectly legitimate. Yeah. I would much rather 
engage a doubter than somebody yeah. who knows everything for sure. Yes, you know? yes, I mean, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Because it means yeah. that basically you have some humility before what you don't know. Yes, yes, yes. It means that you you are seeking to try to to find your way, mm -hmm. and and we speak in all religions of seekers who are on journeys and, sure. and, and on pilgrimages. They are looking to find their way. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think that's a valuable asset. Very, very you know, valuable. I, I would agree. Uh, you know, uh, it, was, it was my doubt and skepticism that brought me to Islam in the first place. <laughs> you and I were talking about we that earlier. We were talking about that yeah, earlier. Yeah, yeah right. I was, you know, I was kind of a confirmed agnostic, yeah. you know, before a, a, a spiritual search led me to Islam. Exactly. And, and as I embraced Islam, I always told people, I said, you can, you can bring me something better I'll take it, right, which right. means that I had to be able, open, uh, open to consider it, yes, you know. Yes, so exactly. it's like, oh, yeah, I'm, and, I, and I still feel that way yes. 38 years uh, after accepting uh, Islam. Mm -hmm. If somebody can show me something better, mm -hmm. I'll accept it. Right. But, you know, I look at the impact that Islam had on me at a, at a personal level, my yes. lifestyle, yes. my worldview, yes, you know, and I'm satisfied with it. But, yes. you know. Bring me something you're different. Open. I'll, you know, I'll sit. I'll sit here if, if, if it's an atheist next to me, right. and we're having a conversation, and he's going to convince me that uh, you know, not believing what I believe will make me a better person. Mm -hmm. I'll consider it. <laughs> well, that's, but right now, I'm a committed believer. Uh, <laughs> I appreciate that. I think that this is one of the challenges that we find in a lot of uh, a lot of theists and and not and, and non-believers as well that they they have a notion of absolutism that causes problems it causes extreme thought I think it closes uh, too many doors it closes too yeah. many doors exactly yeah. right you know uh, I was I was looking at uh, Christianity and Al Islam and I noticed that they put a lot of emphasis on reason and aql in, mm -hmm. in Arabic. Um, do you believe that reason is essential to the quality of your education? Now, we, now we're talking about the other part of, of, uh, of uh, Dr. King's uh, definition of, 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 um, of education, uh, critically, critical thinking. Do you think the reason is essential to the quality of our education? Well, we have been given, thank God, good minds. I mean, the thing that distinguishes us from other creatures primates mm -hmm. uh, is the size and use of our uh, development of our brains and so reason is simply a way of articulating what we know and how and organizing what we have experienced yes, yes. Uh, and 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 so how one organizes one's experience can say a lot about what one's future sure. will be excellent uh, Close. Sure. I, I think uh, you know reason is a a natural human characteristic that mm -hmm. uh, if we are socialized in the right way, we will exercise it in an appropriate way. Mm -hmm. I think we, we live in a world, though, you know, when we start talking about the, the, the secularization of mm -hmm. knowledge, mm -hmm. where reason has been raised to the level mm -hmm. of a deity. Yes. Yes. So yes. in other words, we've got people out there that are saying that, that the only thing that really, the highest, the highest form or the highest form of existence mm -hmm. is the human Brain. mind, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and and those of us of faith, we, we, we challenge that. That's what I a philosopher would call a category mistake. <laughs> That's right, a category <laughs> mistake. Well, we've been talking, we've been talking about uh, this for, uh, at some length, and what I, one of the things I find interesting is that uh, Dr. Matadini was here in the studio, and he said that reason is just a, simply a, a method. And, it and, is. Uh, and I thought that that was, that was very clear, and, uh, and he talked about that science was, was actually answered the question, how things work, and religion asked the question, why? Why things, Why work. things work. And I think that's an excellent way to, to end our program. And I hate and I hate to I hate to leave now though, because I'm getting down to the good questions. But uh, thank you, gentlemen, for for your for your being here on the Scholars Chair. Uh, you can get uh, more programming uh, of the Scholars Chair on the YouTube channel. And uh, one of the things we, we try to direct you to is to uh, is for our audience to leave us comments. And uh, we've been talking about tonight uh, education as a moral imperative. Uh, if you want to get more programming, go to YouTube channel at uh, uh, on YouTube, and you can leave us a comment on Facebook as well, at Facebook slash uh, Khalil Shadid. If you wanted to live, uh, drop us a letter, you can uh, do so by email at scholarschair at gmail .com. I'm Khalil Shadid. Good night. Hit it, hit it, hit it.
amazing.